Okay, Matt, so what kind of currency do aliens use? Yeah, hmm. I don't know. Starbucks. <laughs> oh, man. Yep. You got that from a Laffy Taffy, didn't you? <laughs> I wish. That would at least be a good story. <laughs> <laughs> Good evening, everybody, and welcome to the graveyard. Thank you for joining us tonight. My name is Adam. And my name's Matt. Now, pull up a tombstone or settle into your casket and get comfortable because this is Graveyard Tales. All right, everybody. Matt, how are you doing tonight, brother? Man, I'm awesome. My good. My back's hurting good. a little bit, but I'm I'm gonna I'm gonna survive. I'm toughing it out. You'll make it. All right. I if, hope. If or I won't. If I hear you. Either way. Yeah. Right. <laughs> if I hear you crying, I'll know what's going on. It's not emotion <laughs> from the episode. It's your back. Ah, uh, man. Yeah. Got my got my CBD tea. Nice. Nice. That'll. Uh, I'm telling you, it's stuff. It works, man. It, it, yeah. It's the only thing so far. It's helped my back. Yeah, I, so. I haven't tried the tea yet, but I, I've got a cream CBD cream that I use for my neck, and that's actually the only thing I found that will, when my neck starts spasming or something like that, it'll take it out. So, isn't getting yeah. old fun? <laughs> Get old is a blast. I'm I'm older than you, man. So. I know. Well, <laughs> not, you got not, old. Not, I'm getting not old. Not by a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> I've got. I've yeah. gotten a lot older, like in the last year. And I'm. Yeah. I'm fixing to get. I'm fixing to turn a year older. So I'm like, ugh, man. And I don't ever worry about those numbers, but I wish I could get up in the morning without just creaking and popping. You know? <laughs> <laughs> right. I. I uh, used to tell Ashley that uh, I. I sounded like I was walking on bubble wrap when I got up in the morning and she didn't know what I meant until recently <laughs> when I get up and walk to the bathroom. It's like, crack, 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 crack. I know. I know. It's like I saw, <laughs> I saw the poster that said, you know, some people, they treat their body like a temple. Mine's like a haunted house. Yeah. Right. <laughs> right. Creaks and pops and creaks around every corner. <laughs> All right. So, uh, like we have said uh, for a while now, go check out podbelly.com. Uh, we are part of the Podbelly Network, and we think you would really like podbelly.com. A lot of information, a lot of shows you can check out. Um, another thing is down in the show notes, if you'll run down there um, while you're listening to us or after you listen to us, there are going to be two links to help the wildfire devastation in Australia. We've got one that will go directly to the wildlife foundations down there to help with the wildlife. Um, and another one that is the red cross. Um, so if you're looking for ways to help out, that would be a wonderful thing. They need the help to get this under control. It's devastating. Absolutely. And I, I mean, it breaks my heart to see what's going on down there to see not only the people, who have lost everything, but all of the animals and all that that have lost their homes as well, um, if not their lives. So if you can go help them out, uh, one of those two links down at the bottom would be great. Um, so we have coming up, we've been mentioned this a few times, but we have a live interactive online show Friday, January 24th at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. Um, if you would like to join us, there's a link in the show notes as well to buy a ticket. The tickets are super cheap. They're 99 cents. So if you got an extra buck laying around, you can join us for this interactive show. And it's not where we'll just be talking at you. We will be talking with you, which is the coolest part. You can request to join the stage, quote unquote, um, and we can bring you on and talk to you about whatever you want to talk about, whether it's the episode that we just did or if you just have a random question about what's on Matt's head or something like that. 
then uh, you can... Which, you, which is nothing. Skin. <laughs> skin is on Matt's head. <laughs> you can request to join the stage and talk to us that way. Um, and there is a little sidebar there where you can talk to anybody else who's watching the episode. So if you know people from the Facebook group or, you know, from Twitter or whatever that's watching the show, y'all can talk about the show during the show. So I think it's going to be really cool. Um, and if you have any questions about it, hit us up and we'll help walk you through getting set up there. Um, but we haven't really said what it's going to be about. So Matt, why don't you give him a little teaser as to what we'll be talking about Friday, January 24th at 7 p.m. Central Time. Okay, so uh, strangely enough, uh, certain ancient monuments and, and locations are oriented in such a way around the world that people smarter than Adam and I have figured out that they all have a connection, that they're all aligned with heavenly bodies and one another here on the earth to essentially make a perfect circle around the globe. And we're going to be talking about some of these places and, and how cool this is. Number one, that somebody could figure this out, but that people in ancient times were doing this stuff similar to someone on the other side of the planet and, and how that could possibly right. be. So I, I think you're, you're going to find it, uh, you're going to find it really interesting and it's going to be a lot of fun. And this is, this is not going to be a big math lesson. Um, you know, we're, we're going to approach it in true graveyard tales fashion. So join us Friday night, January 24th at 7 PM central time. Yeah. So like Matt said, join us and it, it's going to be fun. It's not going to be, too difficult to understand because like matt said if we were going to have a math lesson we'd have to get ashley on here she's the accountant she knows math matt and i do not um we just know weird right. facts about weird stuff so um we know it, facts about math <laughs> yeah we know certain facts about math we don't actually know math <laughs> <laughs> math is hard it is man math is difficult all right, so Matt, since you did such an eloquent job telling them what the live show is going to be about, why don't you tell us what we're talking about tonight? Okay, so tonight we're going to discuss the the first alien abduction that really got any kind of attention. It was the first one widely publicized. It was really the first one that was truly investigated. Um, e even after the fact, we're going to be talking about Betty and Barney Hill. And, you know, this story comes well before the Travis Walton case, which I think most people consider to be the most uh, well-known alien abduction case. This, this one was the first one that really had any meat on the bone. Right. Um, so we're going to, we're going to be talking about this and we're going to be talking about what, um, what happened to these guys and uh, what kind of theories might be involved as to what could have happened, what actually did happen. Um, it's it's going to, it's going to be good. It's gonna, I mean, <laughs> you know, it's some, it's some, cra it's some craziness that goes on with this. So uh, they're so always you're, you're going to enjoy it. <laughs> right. So Adam, Adam, tell it, tell us about, uh, tell us about Betty and Barney Hill. All right. Well, this was like Matt was saying, this this was one of the first well documented, well researched alien abduction cases, and it has since then become a very polarizing case. Um, there are people who vehemently argue that they did not have any type of experience or abduction, and there are others who argue the opposite way. There's not many people down the center of this case that don't really know. Well, Matt and I are going to tell you straight up front, we don't really know. They're, you know. No, we don't. <laughs> we, uh, in in typical graveyard fashion, we are not going to make a big claim about what we believe or what we don't believe because we don't have, 
what we feel to be enough information to make that determination. Yeah. No, nor do I think anybody else does, but we'll get into that. Later. Right, right. <laughs> so it was September 20th, 1961, and it was in the evening, late at night, kind of, and Barney and Betty Hill were traveling home and they had not seen another car for miles. But then their trip was interrupted. Now, their experience would kick off an Air Force inquiry, part of the secret initiative Project Blue Book that investigated UFO sightings across the country, was who inquired into this case. So that tells you it was kind of a big deal for the time. Now, the incident would also become the first ever widely publicized alien abduction account, and it shaped how stories like these alien abductions were told and understood from that point on. Now, their road trip was kind of an out-of-the-blue decision that Barney thought the couple needed. Now, Barney was a night shift post office worker, and he was driving 60 miles each way just to get to work and home. Now, Betty's job was handling state child welfare cases so that wasn't any easier. So they were a stressed out couple and they they needed this break. And Barney was like, you know what? Let's do it. Screw it. We're just, you know, drop of the hat decision to do that. And I think we've all been there. We've all had that. Oh, yeah. We just need to get out thing, you know. Let's just go. Yeah, exactly. Let's, you know, leave the kids at home. I don't care if they're five and six years old. Just say, <laughs> screw it. They can take care of themselves for a weekend. If we lock the doors well, they'll be fine. They can find food. That's right. right. There's they got, plenty of food. They got the dogs to keep them company if anything happens, you know. So we've all done it. I've not done that. Don't send <laughs> anybody my way. I've never done that. That was a joke, people. Jeez. So uh, the little free time that the couple had was devoted most of the time to their church and activities that related to the civil rights movement at the time. Now, after about 16 months of marriage, Betty and Barney saw this trip through Montreal and Niagara Falls as kind of their delayed honeymoon because they didn't get one at the time. So apparently they left so impulsively that they had no time to go to the bank before it closed for the weekend. So they got in their car with less than $70 in their pockets. Well, on the last night of their three-day trip, the, the couple was exhausted, tired, and so they stopped and were sipping coffee in a Vermont diner to kind of get some energy back before they finished the drive back home. So Barney was figuring that if they pushed through, they could beat the wind and rains that were uh, approaching from a hurricane that was offshore. So they left the diner around 10 p.m., uh, he was estimating that they could reach their house in Portsmouth, New Hampshire, between 2 a.m. and 3 a.m. at the latest. And again, we've all had those drives where we're like, you know what? Let's just push on. I I don't want to stop and make it a whole nother day. I think I can make this. Right. So you we, down a we've cup only of got coffee three dollars left of the seventy we had. <laughs> <laughs> right, right. So we better can make it back, or we're sleeping in the car. Man, I don't I don't like to go to work with less than seventy dollars. Yeah. You never know what'll happen, man. <laughs> it's less on vacation, of course, it's a different time, but Right. <laughs> well, as they as they drove, they started noticing a strange light in the sky. And this kind of, you know, gave them more reason to hurry up and try to get home. Well, at first they thought maybe it was like a falling star or a meteor or something like that. But Barney was an avid plane watcher and a World War II vet. So he was sure there was nothing to worry about. He said, it's just a satellite and it probably went off course. And he, he was trying to assure Betty that nothing was wrong, that, you know, I've seen something like this before. It, it's a satellite. It, we're fine. Don't worry about it. We're fine. Yeah, we're good. Yeah, keep rolling. We're good. We're good. So the light, though, 
it kind of seemed to move with their car as Barney was driving this curvy mountain road. So it was always following them. The light zigzagged and ducked past the moon and behind trees and mountain ridges. And then it would appear moments later. So it seems sometimes to like move toward them in what they described as a game of like cat and mouse. So they thought, well, it had to be an illusion, right? Maybe the car's movement made it seem like the light was also moving, which, you know, I mean, that that's plausible. You, we've seen that yeah. a light on the horizon as you move. It's kind of, well, it's moving or you turn and it stays in the same place. And you're like, how did that happen? You know? Yeah, yeah, because it's like it's so far away or something right, like that. Right. Yeah. Right. So after a while, though, curiosity overcame them. So they pulled over at this stop, rest stop, picnic area thing to get a closer look. Now, Barney always kept binoculars in his car. World War II vet, post officer, always prepared. So. Through those binoculars, Betty saw that the white light was really an object spinning in the air. She said, Barney, if you think that's a satellite or a star, you're being completely ridiculous. And <laughs> is that what that's exactly what she said? That's what she said. And I've I've <laughs> nailed her voice. I've, I've, I've been working on it. That's an exact <laughs> recreation of her accent and everything. So. <laughs> so barney i mean barney was a smart man he had an iq of 140 and you know he he could not reason anything else out he he knew that betty was right so barney apparently according to his niece kathleen who wrote a book captured the betty and barney hill experience she said that Barney was also a pragmatic man who wouldn't give flying saucers a second thought. Well, the night was too quiet for a helicopter, a commercial plane, or even a military jet with a hotshot pilot. So he didn't want to spook Betty, but he was becoming a little bit concerned. Now, he, he kept thinking to himself, what was this light that's toying with us? I just... You know, I don't know what this is. Can't wrap my head around it because if he's a, quote, pragmatic man who wouldn't give flying saucers a second thought, but he also knows that it's not a falling satellite. He's trying to figure out what this is. So they got in their car and they kept driving. Well, about 70 miles past the diner, the object hovered just above the treetops. Now, it was approximately 100 feet or so above them. Barney quickly stopped his car, but he kept the engine running. Now, he shoved a handgun he'd hidden beneath the seat into his pocket and rushed into a dark field that was next to the car. He ended up leaving Betty in the car. Just, you know, stay here. I'll be back. <laughs> yeah. Which probably didn't make her happy. You yeah. know, I can't imagine she was too happy being left alone like that. So what he saw was as big as a jet but as round and flat as a pancake. And he said, he recalled thinking, my God, what is this thing? This can't be real. What he was looking at had several rows of windows on this pancake shaped thing. And behind the row of windows, there were gray uniform beings that seemed to look right at him. Now he tried to lift his hand to his pistol but for some reason, he couldn't. A voice told him not to put down his binoculars. He, he had this startling thought. We're about to be captured. Now, yelling hysterically, he ran back to the car and barreled down the road as Betty tracked the craft. She was craning her head out the window, trying to keep an eye on it. Well, without explanation, loud rhythmic beeps sounded from the car's trunk. Now, the couple felt instantly drowsy and lost consciousness. They came to around two hours later and 35 miles down the road. You know, I'm impressed. I'm impressed with the fact that at no point in time when Adam was telling us about Betty and Barney that he 
didn't say Betty and Barney Rubble. <laughs> <laughs> I, I've been practicing I, this episode. I'm telling you, the whole time he's talking, I'm going, he's going to say it. He's going to say Betty and Barney Rubble. <laughs> Yeah, well, you wouldn't believe how many times that came up in searching the information for this. You type in Betty and Barney, and there's two two entries you'll get. You'll get Hill or Rubble. Oh man, oh I don't know why I'm I'm in third grade. That's so funny. <laughs> but uh, but anyway, I digress. So right up until that time, Barney. He'd come back to the car, and he he said he had the that thought in his head, we're going to be captured. Now, the next thing that Barney and Betty realized was that they were on the road, headed home, but the trip had taken two hours longer than they had anticipated. Right. So essentially, they had lost two hours of time and they couldn't account for. Like mm-hmm. I said, the last thing Barney remembers was running back to the car with the thought in his head that they were going to be captured. Right. Okay. So when they finally got back home to Portsmouth, it was dawn. And obviously they were relieved to be home, but they were far from feeling okay about everything. Betty's dress was torn and Barney's shoes were unusually scuffed. In fact, I read one account that said they were scuffed so bad across the toes, he couldn't wear them anymore. So, Oh, that's bad. Yeah, I mean, and and why across the top of the toes? That's another thing. That's almost like you were unconscious and somebody was dragging you. Right. Like forward. Right. But but what, what really happened to them? So Betty had contacted the Air Force to report the incident because she was worried about radiation exposure. So Betty called their close friend, Major Paul Henderson, at a near at nearby Pease Air Force Base. And she reported a UFO sighting. Now, interestingly enough, Major Henderson found that her story was corroborated by two separate UFO reports from radar data from two different Air Force installations nearby. And all all the reports... I'd say that's good corroboration. Absolutely. Military bases doing it. Yeah. Now, all three reports, Betty's and the two Air Force reports, are officially recorded in Project Blue Book. So... She began to to research this and started checking out books on UFOs from her local library. Now, over the next couple of years, Betty was plagued with nightmares and Barney had developed an ulcer and horrific anxiety. So they pretty much just felt like, man, our, our, our lives are screwed up now. Right, right. And, and they weren't really sure what to do. So they finally sought medical help for their mental health. And anxiety is a, a, a common thread in people who claim abduction. They, they all end up with anxiety issues or anxiety attacks afterward. Well, and, and over the course of this time, Betty had been keeping a journal of the dreams that she was having. Smart. Um, and they were all dreams about you know, kidnapping and, and all these things. And, you know, she just, she couldn't wrap her head about it around it, but imagine, imagine you're, you're, uh, you're the Hills and you had this happen to you. You, you lost two hours of time that you cannot recall. And, and now everything is different for you. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, the, the anxiety, the, the lack of sleep, you know, the worry, the concern. I mean, Barney had an ulcer, you know, life was just, it was not what it was after this thing. And they can't figure out why, because they don't really know what happened to them. Right. So, I mean, on, on top of just the trauma of, of what would have happened, not even knowing was making it a thousand times worse. So Betty and Barney met with Benjamin Simon, a psychiatrist and neurologist 
with a specialization in hypnosis. Now, Dr. Simon would use a technique called regression hypnosis to allow Betty and Barney to access the memories of what had happened during their abduction. Six months of weekly sessions in 1964 revealed their story. Now, remember, this happened in 1961. Mm -hmm. It was 1964 before they actually started working with Dr. Simon to get through this stuff. That's a long time. But before we start digging into all that, let, let's talk briefly about regression hypnosis so we can understand how the story of what the Hills went through was learned. Now, hypnotic regression is the process by which you enter a trance and recall material from deep inside that's normally not available, not available to the conscious mind. You know, hypnosis enables the mind to travel more easily across time. Mm -hmm. Regression is the process by which the hyp hypnos uh, the <laughs> hypnotist. Too many of those words are strung together. <laughs> <laughs> The, the hypnotist guides you back through time to particular events that need to be examined. So it is actually relatively simple. You are suggested under hypnosis to travel back through the years to recall those specific memories. Now, psychology teaches us that some memories can be so traumatic that they become essentially buried in the subconscious. Mm -hmm. Regression therapy helps bring these memories out so that they can be dealt with, but the results can cause an individual to not just remember, but actually relive those events that their brain had tried to quash. The therapy in and of itself can be just as traumatic as the actual event. Sure. Okay. Now, that was the case with Betty and Barney. And Dr. Simon... Uh, recorded his sessions with the Hills and you can actually go and you can listen to their reactions while they're going through this regression hypnosis. And especially in Barney's, I mean, you can, you can hear the, the horror in his voice. Yeah. I mean, you, you can tell that he is terrified of, of what's going on and what, what he feels like is about to happen to him. Um, and, you know, the, the recordings are not spectacular. It's not like listening to, you know, Graveyard Tales. <laughs> um, but it, it's it's good enough that, you know, you can understand what they're saying. And like I said, you can you can really feel that fear, um, especially, like I said, especially Barney. So um, so if you if 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 you enjoy this topic. Go and listen. Now, there are out. You're not going to sit down and listen to this on a long road trip. I mean, no. there's like hours and hours and hours and hours and hours of this. But, you know, really great people have gone and cut out the the major impactful snippets so that you, you can go and find them and, and listen to the story in their own words. Now. Dr. Simon initially met with Betty and Barney individually in hopes to prevent one story from influencing the other, even going as far as inducing amnesia at the end of the sessions to prevent the two from discussing what they had remembered. Wow. And, and in Barney's case, Dr. Simon was so worried that the memories would be so traumatic that he told Barney that he was not going to allow him to hang on to those memories until he was certain that the the trauma wouldn't wouldn't cause him more problems in his day to day life. Right. So, you know, and initially his thought was, well, I can't have them going home and talking about this because it's going to influence the following sessions. Sure. But even beyond that, he was so worried that Barney was just going to by bringing out these memories, he was he was just going to be. You know, he, he would be useless. Uh, have I mean, a it mental would just, breakdown. It would break him down. So let's start with Betty's story. So in Betty's story, the, the beings took her into an examination room. Her clothes were removed, but the beings were seemingly unaware of how to work the zipper on her dress 
and eventually tore the dress as well as the tough zipper material. So I think everybody knows you you know you know the material that the zipper's attached to. Mm-hmm. You know, you know that I mean, yeah, it's like, you know, it's like really really tough, almost like like nylon. I mean, it's uh, Kevlar almost. Yeah, you're not you're not just ripping that with your bare hands. You know, right. It's but they did. Um and as I mentioned earlier when they got home, Betty realized that her dress had been torn. Now and, and and speaking of that dress, Betty kept that purple dress for over 40 years as evidence of her experience. So, yeah, and it meant something to her then to hang on to but, it that long. You know, it, it was it was one of the things that she felt like showed that this had really happened to her, that she didn't do this. Right. You know, that this had really happened. Now, Betty said the examiners took samples of her skin and hair, and nail clippings. Ooh, freaky. Oh, um, yeah. They described long needles used to probe along her head, arms, legs, and spine. Yeah. And at one point, the examiners inserted a long needle into Betty's navel, which she reports caused severe pain. Mm. Um, and all the while this was going on, a being that Betty called the leader oversaw the exam. So, now, real quick. The needle in the navel, that gets me. Like, that gives me the willies a little bit because have you ever been digging out, like, navel lint and you hit the back of your belly button a little too hard? That hurts, man. That gives you, like, a pain down in your groin area. It's weird. (laughs) It's like you got some crazy nerve endings down there. Yeah. So if, if you guys listening just stuck your finger in your belly button and pushed on the inside, I want to know about it. (laughs) <laughs> Y'all tell me if you did that. Everybody tried it. Oh, yeah. Every, everybody tried it. <laughs> I was doing it while I was talking about it. So. <laughs> now, you know, now, now, Betty, Betty says at a later time that she thought this was some kind of pregnancy test or, or, or something along those lines. And right. I'm like, whoa, wait. <laughs> yeah. It's a big needle. You know, yeah, it's the I don't, wrong I don't place know to if they were it. testing, you know, he'd stab you in there in the belly. That's <laughs> not a thing to do. But I, I've seen an amniocentesis needle, too. That thing will terrify. Uh, you yeah, know, that's, like, that's true. Get that out of here. Where are you sticking that? That's. <laughs> <laughs> now, at one point, Betty recalls that after her examination, the beings came back into her room very excitedly having discovered that Barney's teeth could be removed. Now, when I read this <laughs> in my head, there's these little gray aliens running around holding Barney's teeth and they're yes. like those little chatter teeth and they're like, yes. la, 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 and they think it's hilarious. Yep. That's and, exactly what I pictured too. But she remembers explaining to them that Barney's dentures were due to human aging, which she says was a fact that the beings had a difficult time understanding. Now, at one point, Betty remembered Brent being alone with the leader and asking where they were. And she says she was shown a three-dimensional star map. Now, while under hypnosis, Betty was able to draw a scaled-down two-dimensional version of this map. Now, the map was reproduced in multiple publications And in the late 1960s, a teacher named Marjorie Fish attempted to construct a 3D model in hopes of finding a matching star pattern. Now, after several attempts, Fish finally found a perfect match. All the stars lay roughly on the same plane, and the aliens apparently came from the Zeta Reticulum system. Now, the viewpoint was slightly above the star Zeta II Reticuli, now, th- there's some question on this. It's either just a little over 39 or 37 light years from Earth. I've heard both. And I'm thinking 39 light years. God, I mean, 37, 39. It's far away. Yeah. It's it's farther than we can even imagine getting to. Um, 
but it was it was interesting. I mean, Marjorie Fish just she attacked this the star map idea um, and, and spent a long time. I mean, this was not just something she did in her spare time and said, oh, look, yeah, right. I mean, she constructed multiple models to try to find a match. And I mean, you can imagine how many stars and galaxy systems and everything she's going through to going, yep, not this, eh, not that. Uh, no, uh, it's close. Uh, no, you know, she she never could quite get it. But the interesting thing about the the Zeta, the Zeta two reticuli was that the stars or at least some of the stars in that system are very, very similar to our own sun. And so the assumption was. It is a, a system around a star like our own sun would be one that could support life. Right. To, to me, that's a leap. I mean, you know, our star supports our human life and the, the life of all the living creatures on this planet. Mm -hmm. Now, who's to say that just because there's another star like our sun that there's other you know it would have to be identical to us to support life just like we have on this planet what sure. if the life is not like our planet doesn't necessarily yeah. mean that the the sun the star has got to be like our sun but that was a key point is that it just so happened that this was the matching system and that those particular stars were so much like our sun now it was interesting, too, that, that Betty said in the map, and on her drawing, you can see this. On the map, there are solid lines going out from it, and then there's kind of a, a, a dashed line, and then there's some that are even, even fainter than that. And she said the leader explained to her that the solid lines were places that they go frequently. And that the dashed lines were places that they go occasionally. And this other type of line were expeditions. They were un mm -hmm. unknown, uncharted territories. And it was interesting that our solar system had a nice, big, solid line, right? <laughs> it's like, we go there all the time. You know, That's our, it's like uh, our summer home. It's like they go. They go to the Milky Way. They go to BW threes, um, and they go, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and they yeah. go to this one because they've got a McDonald's. Um, but yeah, I mean that that was interesting that that you know she uh, she brought that up that that's what those lines indicated and that that you know they indicated that they came here all the time. Now. Barney Sessions revealed a story that was a lot like Betty's. So he recalled getting out of his car and actually firing his 45 at the craft. Now, this was under hypnosis because you remember when Adam said, you know, initially, Barney only remembered being unable to put down his binoculars to draw his gun. Mm -hmm. Now, he recalled driving the car away from the UFO but that afterwards he felt irresistibly compelled to pull off the road and drive into the woods. He eventually sighted six men standing in the dirt road. Now, remember, it's night. You know, why Why would there be six dudes out standing in the road? Yeah, even rednecks don't do that normally unless they're no, and they're, they're not <laughs> And they're not working on the, on the road, so... No, but uh, he said the car the car stalled and three of the men approached the car. Now they told Barney not to fear them, but he was still really anxious, and he reported that the leader told Barney to close his eyes. Now Barney describes the beings beginning with the description of the aliens' uniforms. Now he says they wore peaked caps and a quote unquote uniform with silver piping, which he said reminded him of the Nazi SS Panzer uniforms. Now, Barney remembered seeing what he called a red-headed Irishman. 
as well as other beings that didn't appear human. And he said the Irishman spoke to him in English, but also communicated to him silently in a way that he could understand. So some kind of telepathic. Now, Betty right. also recalled this telepathic kind of communication, too. So Barney recalled the long probes being placed along his spine and remembers thinking that the beings were counting his vertebrae. And he, too, said the examiners took samples of tissue and body fluids. Now, Barney's sessions, like we said, were very emotional with, with his fear during the abduction being more evident. And Barney did say that he's kept his eyes closed in terror during a large portion of his exam. But he did describe the eyes of the beings and how they seemed to penetrate him, staring into his eyes as if they were, as Barney said, entering his brain. And under hypnosis, Barney was quoted as crying out, oh, those eyes, they're in my brain. So that, I, that would be weird, a weird feeling. To, yeah. I mean, we've all had that feeling like someone's looking at you and it, you feel like they're looking through you kind of thing, you know, but to literally have that to have someone yeah. examining you from the inside out just by looking at you that would be weird yeah so six months of this you know they they endured to try to figure out what exactly happened to them and and how they could process it and work their way through it now when everything was said and done dr simon concluded that Betty and Barney Hill did, in fact, believe that they had experienced an alien abduction. But Simon speculated that Barney's recollection of the UFO encounter was possibly a fantasy inspired by Betty's dreams. Now, remember, I mentioned earlier that Betty was keeping a journal of the dream she was having. Now, mm -hmm. you know, you know that Barney heard these stories probably more often than he wanted to. Right. So over the course of, of a couple of years, he, he's hearing the same stuff over and over and over from, you know, Betty's dream journal. And it's, I'm sure it's beginning to lock into his head. Well, that's what Dr. Simon thought as well. So Simon thought that this was the most reasonable and consistent explanation now, Barney disagreed. Now, remember, Adam mentioned that um, Barney was probably more, more than a skeptic. He pretty much scoffed at the idea of UFOs. Right. But after working through this regression hypnosis, he's, he's come around. He, he's, he's, he's a believer now. And, uh, you know, he, he wasn't really, he wasn't on Betty's level. Betty, Betty had bought in a thousand mm -hmm. percent, you know, she, she was, she was full bore. Um, Barney was, was, he was there now, but he just, he wasn't as, um, as enthusiastic about it as Betty was. Now, even though the Hills and Dr. Simon disagreed about the validity of their experience, both parties agreed that the sessions had been beneficial because the couple was no longer experiencing this horrible anxiety that was just messing up their lives. So there there was a benefit to it. So right. They actually got the benefit of the whole reason people go through regress and hypnosis anyway, you know, for for something that's not related to an alien abduction. Um, so, you know, it. If nothing else, they managed to work through what was uh, what was tearing them up. So, um, but the the story is just it, it's so amazing. Now it, it's interesting to point out that a, a lot of skeptics have torn this story apart. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and I mean, they have anybody comes out with a story like this. Skeptics are going to attack it. You know, it's it's like a like a like a dog on a bone. Right. Here we go. You right. know, and, and begin to try to poke holes through it. And like Adam said, we're not going to sit here and 
say, oh, well, you know, we're going to shoot down all of the theories against uh, Barney and Betty Hill's story. We're, right. We're not. We're not going to do that. But we are going to share <laughs> some of the theories that people think may have actually happened. And, and w- w- one thing that's curious is the description of the aliens, because this is really the first description of what we now think of as a gray. Right. Exactly. Okay. You know, the, the, the thin folks that, you know, we, we didn't talk about it in the story, but they do describe, you know, the. The, the the elongated eyes that kind of the wraparound eyes the the slitted mouth the the very flat nose with the openings um you know that was the description of of the beings of the examiners and whatnot so um we really didn't have that description of aliens you know widely published until this story right but it it was interesting that only i think i read 12 days prior to the night of betty and barney hill's abduction there was an episode of the outer limits which if you're not familiar with it was kind of like a twilight zone type show yeah except it was you know okay it it was like a twilight zone show i I don't know how to describe (laughs) it i remember watching reruns of it with my dad when i was a kid you know, you'd, you'd I'd, I'd watch three shows with my dad that came on like after the news when I was a kid. The Twilight Zone reruns, and then you would get Night Gallery, mm-hmm. which was Rod Serling's post Twilight Zone show, and then you had Outer Limits, and the the Outer Limit ones were always a little bit more fringy. You know, they they were they were much more sci fi oriented. Sure. Yeah. Um, as I recall, uh, as opposed to, you know, the the Twilight Zone always seemed very, you know, very ironic. Yeah. You know that. You know, I I remember the one the guy you know, nuclear bomb goes off, wipes out everybody, and the the guy survived because he was he had locked himself in the bank vault so he could read. All he wanted to do is read. Yeah. And he figures out he's there alone and he goes to the library and he can read all the books and he steps on his glasses, you know, yeah, yep. he's got like prescription ashtrays and he's like, <laughs> <laughs> you know, <laughs> but anyway, anyway, so a, a lot of the skeptics will, um, will talk about that idea that watching the outer limits and seeing that put that description in their head and so under hypnosis that's the description that came out because that's an alien Mm -hmm. but barney and betty claimed that they they had no idea that that was a show that there was an outer limits about aliens and they said neither one of them had watched it so and that's possible because at the time you weren't inundated with commercials for tv shows like we are now that you know, you're watching one one channel and it says on so-and-so channel, there's going to be a thing. You know, it, it wasn't it wasn't as publicized. The shows weren't as publicized yeah. as they are now. So it's very possible that there could have been a show on that they had no idea about. Yeah. And hey, for those of y'all that are like under maybe 25, we used to have to go to the television when the show came on. <laughs> yeah dvr was not a thing if you missed it you missed it yeah if if you weren't at if you weren't tuned into nbc at eight o'clock you missed it right <laughs> i missed a lot of shows I'm, that way i'm i'm messing around i'm I, I think that that technology hadn't been around that long most, most people remember those days or, well, we or, having, or having to try to program a VCR to record it. Oh, Lord. Yeah. I never I, figured that out. Yeah. You, you, you needed like a, you needed a physicist and, you know, <laughs> a, a mathematician and somebody to figure that out. I mm-hmm. never, never, ever got it to work right. Nope. So like Matt was saying, there's a lot of, quote, scientific explanations that people have tried to throw at the Hill abduction case to say this is 
really what they experienced and they didn't experience what they're saying. Um, so one thing, though, to keep in mind while we're going over these theories is that there were two people involved in this. It wasn't just an individual experience. So we have to consider that when we try to explain it. You can't take something that could possibly fit for a single person and you say, well, yeah, I mean, that that's plausible because nobody else witnessed it, yada, yada, yada. There was a couple who witnessed this. So some explanations that are put out there don't actually fit. Yeah. Two people with remarkably similar stories. Mm hmm. You know, that, you know, claim to have amnesia for two hours uh, of a trip home. Right. And, uh, you know, under separate hypnosis can produce, you know, almost identical details about what occurred during that two hours. Right. So one of the first ones that people try to throw out there is the one that you see thrown out there for every Every story that someone has of Fortiana or anything like that is that they were doing this for financial gain or social gain. Now, like Matt and I were talking, how would they have benefited from this exactly? They were a biracial couple in the 1960s. They were already yeah. having problems in society. Society, you know, during that time did not approve of that. So they were already not in good standings with their neighborhood or, or whatever. So how would bringing a radical story like that out into the public actually benefit them at all? Right. I mean, and, and Barney didn't want to exactly, you know, he wanted to keep it quiet because I mean, yeah, yeah. Why, why bring that much attention to yourself? I mean, mm -hmm. to before this, those type stories were not publicized. That's why this story is so unique. Is that it was the first one that was really publicized widely, and why, why want that? Mm -hmm. I mean, in 1961, why want that? Regardless of of anything else, yeah, exactly. I mean, that's truthfully, not... I mean, I, I can't even fathom at that time, you know, society was so different and it, I mean, people were shunned, people lost their jobs over so much less. Yeah, exactly. So, so why even bring it up? But if you're, you know, an interracial couple in night in the 1960s, in, in the middle of the civil rights movement, why in the hell would you want to bring that up publicly and and take on that kind of scrutiny? Yeah, I, I just a, I can't even fathom. And and the thought that you were going to somehow make money off of this. Yeah. Yeah. You, you, it's a story that already would get you labeled as crackpots and outcast in your society. And it's it's not one that I think somebody in the 1960s would say, hey, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to create this story because I saw on an Outer Limits TV show something similar to this. I'm going to create this story to bring attention to myself and I'm going to get lots of money and stuff from it because there was no history of that happening to people. Yeah. You know, there were no we didn't have YouTube where people went on and claimed these crazy ass things that got them attention and downloads and then they made money from it. That's not how it worked. So it would have been a really hard to get the story out there for financial gain. And, and B it's not something that people are going to just pay you to talk about at the time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So obviously Matt and I don't believe that one. <laughs> if that gee if, if that wasn't apparent if we didn't put too fine a point on it yeah right <laughs> so uh, another one that people throw out is that hypnosis actually creates the abduction 
Now, psychologists argue that hypnosis encourages the creation and recall of detailed fantasies. The Hill case had what is common now in alien abduction cases, um, you know, with the the medical examinations or procedures, uh, communication with alien captors and some powerful mystical feelings. But, you know, it, it was said that under hypnosis, these were missing memories and, and they were recovered. But a lot of skeptics believe that those were actually implanted memories and they didn't, you know, they had some issues. They, they had something happen, but the hypnotist was actually causing these memories to be implanted in them rather than pulling them out. And we know that hypnosis can do that. You can plant suggestions or memories into somebody through hypnosis. That's not like a secret, but that's what a lot of people are saying happened with Betty and Barney was that they had this experience implanted and the hypnotist was toying with them. Yeah, which would be a pretty crappy thing to do. Yeah, that, that's a real douche move right there. And and again, why? What a douche pickle if that's the tr- if that's the truth, you know. I mean, I mean, obviously, uh, Benjamin Simon, you know, he's he's known for this case. Mm-hmm. Um, I, I'm not I'm not really sure if 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 I'm trying to be a legitimate psychiatrist and neurologist in my field that this would be what I would want to be known for. Yeah. Again, during that time. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So that I can see that it's reasonable that it could be done. Yes. We're we're not, you know, we're not saying that that's impossible to do. I mean, we've, I think everybody has, has seen a hypnotist on TV or been to one of these shows where they put in a suggestion and, and, you know, it, it sticks. Um, but the idea of, of having some kind of malicious intent to, to put this in these couples brain, I mean, you're trying to help them ultimately work through whatever's going on Mm -hmm. and it was successful. So, you know, at, at least according to Dr. Simon and the Hills, they had successful sessions because their anxiety went away. Um, so why implant such horrific traumatic memories you know for them to work through if if they weren't already there right um so i can like i said i can see where it's possible i don't know that it's plausible and i and i don't know how that would because i'm not intelligent enough to uh to to see how that would happen by happenstance right that just the process of of going through this regression hypnosis would would implant that by by mistake. Well, you know, there is I mean, there's evidence that especially here recently that if suggested, then your brain can take that and create an abduction case. It's been done um, <laughs> to, to prove it. It's you know, it's been done. But what makes me not fully believe it is how similar their stories were and if it was implanting something to then make the brain go off on a tangent and create this you've got two people and their their story is almost identical how would that happen if it was all a a recreation of that person's brain you know what i mean um If you want to take a single person, implant that and let them go, then you have nothing to check it against. And yeah, sure. There's you an implanted abduction theory. Yeah. But I don't know. And I I think, too, some people take that that idea of the Outer Limits show having been on and that maybe being in um, in Barney's brain and then this idea of abduction. Now the dreams that Betty were having were not of 
what actually happened. They were dreams involving this kidnapping and abduction in in a general sense. They were nightmares. They were they were scary to her, but they weren't specific to the the alien abduction. And I I guess I could see where if if Betty had watched that and that that imagery was in her head and then it's all buried in her subconscious and mm. then somebody starts digging around in there and starts poking, you know, poking bears. Right. Hey, what are you doing over here? Hey, look at you. And and brings up these two memories along with others at the same time that they the brain just kind of says, I don't know what to do with this and squishes them together. Sure. Sure. And now you've got, oh, I got this alien of a TV show. Oh, I've got these horrific, you know, night terrors of being abducted. Bam. Alien abduction. Right. But that that would have hold, held true for one of them. Mm-hmm. Barney wasn't having these dreams. He wasn't afraid of abduction. Now, he had listened, I'm sure, to Betty's stories about her dreams. So maybe, I don't know. Again, th- this is... You know, the, we're 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 wading into muddy waters, and we're not trying to convince you one way or the other. We're just trying to present what people have discussed regarding the validity of their story. Right. Exactly. Now, another theory that is brought up by skeptics, and again, we're using the term skeptic loosely because most of these people fall along what Matt and I would call cynics unwilling to believe something weird, even if the evidence is there. Um, But, you know, they're labeled as skeptics, so we will will leave it with that description. Um, But one of the things that skeptics point at for explaining alien abduction theory is sleep paralysis. Now, studies suggest that Neuropsychological theories, particularly sleep paralysis and temporal lobe sensitivity, could explain claims of alien abduction. Now, sleep paralysis is obviously this feeling of being conscious but unable to move, which occurs when a person passes between stages of wakefulness and sleep. We've discussed sleep paralysis before because I have had it several times. Um, And you got to remember, they were driving they were not sleeping. How could sleep paralysis explain the Hill case? They were not asleep. Right. So I don't I don't think it fits. You know, I don't I don't think yeah, that I, one I, is plausible in any way, shape, or form to the Hill case. I don't either. I, I would I I would be more apt to believe that you know the the Hills just made it up. Yeah. You know, rather than other than this. Sure. You know, that, sure. you know, and, and, you know, the whole idea of the time frame and everything, you know, it doesn't matter. But, you know, nobody knew this story until the Hills decided to meet with Dr. Simon. Mm-hmm. So it could have happened whenever and they could have just chosen. Oh, it happened back in 1961 when we took this trip to Niagara Falls and we did all this other stuff. Yeah. Um. You know, so I, I don't think that. You know, if they if they just made it up, but that that seems more reasonable to me than and saying there was a sleep yeah. paralysis situation. Yeah, I mean, you'd be sleep driving if that were the case. Yeah, I'm, I mean, you know, un, un, unless, like we said, it, it it happened at a at a different time, or mm-hmm. it happened sometime during the trip, and you know, they repressed all those memories, and yeah, you know, now we're bringing back memories of a sleep paralysis event. Sure. Um, But again, I I don't know that that's necessarily the case. No, me either. Um, So this next one, Matt and I are not going to spend any time talking about because we've talked about it before. And Matt and I do not like this explanation at all. We hate this explanation for most things. And that's mass hysteria. Yeah. And we're not going to validate mass hysteria by continuing to talk about it anymore (laughs) yeah so you know the fact that two people at the same time experienced the hallucination of all of this happening Mm -hmm. no no thanks highly highly unlikely right 
So the last one we got is sleep deprivation. And the, the quote that I copied down is skeptic Michael Shermer once collapsed from sleep deprivation following an 83-hour bike race and his support team rushed to his aid. Now, Shermer was caught in a, quote, walking dream, so he perceived the support team as aliens from the 1960s television series The Invaders. So they're saying if he can do that from sleep deprivation, then that could be what happened with the Hills. Now, obviously, Michael Shermer is a skeptic going into it, so he's going to say that that is the cause of all alien abduction theories or most of them. Um, but to me, sleep deprivation is fairly valid for this thing, because if you're sleep deprived, we all know you can hallucinate things and, and we know that Betty and Barney were pushing to try to get home. It was late at night and they were tired. They were trying to get there. And so sleep deprivation, I can see as being valid when it comes to maybe them hallucinating what was going on with the light following them. Mm -hmm. You know, thinking that the light was following them and everything, and it was just a light off in the distance. Well, with your brain not functioning like it should because of lack of sleep, you could hallucinate some of these things or interpret what you're seeing incorrectly. Yeah. Um, but again, this falls along the lines of both of them having to have the same hallucinations or or interpretations of what's happening during concurrent sleep deprived states. Yeah. And I don't I I I don't see them hallucinating the same thing. Yeah. And you know, on this theory, I know that this could never happen to uh Amanda and me. Oh because yeah. Because if if we're ever on a road trip and um, we're, we would both be sleep deprived. Whoever's in the passenger seat is snoring. <laughs> <laughs> right. I, I mean, that's just, that's just the way it is. <laughs> yeah. I get in that passenger seat and it's just like, good night. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so there, there's no sleep deprivation for the passenger, <laughs> just the driver. Right. You know, so I'm like, well, what, what the heck was Betty doing staying up? She should have been taking a nap. Man, take you know? a nap if you're that tired. <laughs> and, you know, um, we're, we're talking about the ways people are are uh, debunking the Hill story. I, you know, I, one thing I, I, I didn't mention um, about the star map that Betty drew and the model that Marjorie Fish uh, created from that. Um, and, and this kind of goes more to the validity, at least in my opinion, it does. Um, the, for the fact that, that Marjorie was able to take that drawing and create this model and then match it to an actual existing star system. It's interesting because like I said, it took her a while to do this. It wasn't until 1969 when the uh, when the Gleiss star catalog was published. So time wise, there was really no way for Betty to have looked at this, picked out this star system and generate her star map from that. Right. Because it it wasn't published. You know, there it, it that that Zeta reticuli wasn't configured and and published in previous um, star catalogs. Mm -hmm. it, it was in the 1969 one, right? Which you know was eight years after this supposedly happened, and at least five years after Betty produced the drawing of the star map under hypnosis. So a lot of people have really attacked this star map thing. Um, but that's interesting. You know, yeah. it, it's interesting that 
she 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 even claimed that she did not have any kind of astrological knowledge um had never studied it and even to have studied it the information she would have needed to make this particular map wasn't available Mm -hmm. and what are the chances that she just said Hey, here's a star. Here's one. Here's this. This is a little bit bigger. This looks like a planet. This okay. There it is. There's my star map, and it match anything exactly. Right. So, you know, it's cra- crazy stuff. Crazy oh, yeah. stuff. And but like we said, you know, I don't. I don't think there's enough information either way for Adam and I or anybody else for that matter to point a finger at the hills and go. You completely made this up, you know, or, you know, to, to go, yeah, this absolutely happened. Right. You know, this is, this is the real deal We're we're left and at least in my take somewhere in the middle, you know? So yeah, I don't know, and that, but it's, it's that, a really, it's a really great story. It is. And, and that, that's a shame that we are left in the middle. Um, we're left in the middle with a lot of these things that we discuss, there's not enough evidence one way or another to prove or disprove it. So what what do you guys think? Do, you, do y'all think that the Hills legitimately had an abduction experience or do you think they made it up completely or do you think it was an implanted hypnosis type event um, let us know. I mean, you know, we ask you this all the time. Get on Facebook or Twitter or email us or get on our website. Um, and there's a thing where you can click and go over uh, and drop us a note. Let us know what you think. And, you know, let, let's talk about it. Yeah. And so while you're doing that, check out the rest of our website. It's graveyardpodcast.com. And on our website, You can find out more about Adam and myself. Uh, You can listen to the show. You can find links to buy Graveyard Tales merchandise. And you can become a patron. Mm -hmm. And now you can find links to buy tickets to our See You Live event on Friday, January the 24th at 7 p.m. Central Standard Time. And you can find a link to buy tickets to our live show in Pigeon Forge, Tennessee, on help me out adam july 18th july 18th and that is with hillbilly horror stories uh you can find links to both of those to get your tickets uh so we're really looking forward to both of these events Mm -hmm. and uh we hope you guys can join us and as always check us out on social media we're on facebook uh instagram and twitter and uh go and rate and review us on uh on itunes uh, it really helps us get up the charts, and it brings more people into the graveyard. So, until next time, we'll save you a seat in the graveyard. See you soon. See you soon.